Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, my name is Leah Say, and I am the Assistant Manager of Public Policy Communications at General Motors. I serve as GM's lead communicator and media relations contact on state and local issues and support various topics including autonomous vehicles, advanced technology, North American manufacturing, and global and federal issues. Uh, my relationship with the Planck Center began a few years ago while I was pursuing my master's in advertising and public relations at the University of Alabama, and it really is an honor to be here today with you all to discuss millennials, diversity, and inclusion in the PR industry. Jessica White, Dr. Carla Gower, and the Planck Center Board continually work to support students, educators, and practitioners by advancing knowledge of leadership values and skills in the profession. Through research, programs like the Challenge for Emerging Leaders, the Educator Fellowship Program, numerous online resources, and webinars like these, the Center continues to bridge the gap between the practice and academia. As mentioned, today we will be discussing millennials, diversity, and inclusion in the PR industry. This work is designed to start conversations about millennial communication professionals, cultural perceptions in the workplace, and can be done on individual and organizational levels to support open, diverse, and inclusive workplace cultures. With that, I'd like to introduce you to today's exceptional group of panelists, many of whom I call friends, who have a breadth of knowledge and experience in this space. First, I have Ariel Ellis, who only serves as a professor at Lipscomb University in the Department of Communication and Journalism, where she teaches courses in leadership, organizational communication, public relations, and cross-cultural communication. With her consulting practice at Vary 83, she is committed to helping organi organizational leadership transform culture at all levels. She is author of the book, The Original Millennial, Lessons in Leadership for the Millennial Generation, which is an awesome book, by the way. Elise Vasquez is a recent graduate of the University of Texas at Austin. She recently announced as the single national recipient of the Daniel J. Edelman and PRSSA Award and is interning with Edelman Los Angeles, a leading global communications marketing firm. She has a firm belief that professional development serves as one of the greatest avenues of empowerment. She phrased this belief in the role she plays as communications officer of We Too Our America, where she oversees marketing efforts and partnerships that empower the immigrant community. Next, we have Zhang Meng, who's an assistant professor of PR at the University of Georgia. Her research focuses on leadership and public relations, measurement, trust, employee engagement, and reputation management. Dr. Meng also founded and directs UGA's Ad PR to China Study Abroad program. Dr. has received more than $190,000 in funding grants to support her research in the past six years. And last, we have Dr. Bruce K. Berger, who is a professor emeritus of the Advertising and Public Relations in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. In addition to being the founding director and research director of the Planck Center for Leadership and Public Relations, he serves on the Board of Advisors. Doctor's research encompasses public relations leadership, employee communications, and public policy influence. His research gardeners acclaim in both the academy and in the profession, and that is an accomplishment that very few can rightfully claim. So as you guys are listening, we encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box that you guys can see online for our panelists, and we'd ask you to hold all your questions, um, and we'll get to them at the end of the webinar. So feel free to type them, and we'll, we'll address them at the end. Now, to get things started, I will pass the ball off to you, Ariel. Thank you for joining us today. We want to get started setting the tone by having a conversation specifically about how millennials have redefined the space of diversity and inclusion. If you could, or where everyone's ideas are valued, where risks are taken to support high potential ideas and dynamic leaders as they realize their dreams, solve their problems within their community. One of the most important aspects of this is giving all of us a way to understand how to embody the culture that is all within us, and how culture is shifting, mainly because culture is a way of life. Culture emerges, and it's organic, it's happening all around us. Uh, we build culture as we go along our day-to-day -day lives, and it's an important part of understanding how generations work. If we consider the way in which the globalization of, say, music, business, 
education, politics, social media, and even the most recent Black Lives Matter movement, and even the more recent Take a Knee movement, hashtag movements, if you will, have taken hold of our attention and also our patterns of competence, communication, and consumption, as a result, have shifted dramatically. But it also leads us to this question, why? Why is this so? Why is this the norm? And it leads us to also ask not only why, but why not? And essentially, it's because we're at the, at the, at the crux of a cultural shift. And this shift is being led by the millennial generation. And one of the ways in which we answer that question is, of course, by simply asking the question. One of the things that the millennial generation does most effectively, if you will, is answer or ask the question why, and then determine the best ways to answer that. If we're heavy, we're problem solvers, we're extremely creative, we're pioneering and coming up with ideas. We're connected to one another as well as to our community. Uh, we're very forward thinking. We're also very bold, collaborative, and experimental. And as we see all those major attributes that are connected to the millennial generation, we have to ask why are the stereotypes about our generation so deeply embedded in the language around who millennials truly are? It's the change is complex. Change way of, of creating some difficulties for us. And that change is so complex. It's, we often have frustration from the ways in which uh, generations are 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 uh, working alongside one another. And frustration can also create resistance. Many times, when generations are in workspaces together, we have this resistance to actually work together and find opportunities to develop synergy. There's also anxiety sometimes. There's anxiety from lack of resources or underutilized opportunities for resources. And then there's confusion that makes change complex. And confusion oftentimes has a lot to do with us being uncertain about, about what direction we're going in culturally. So that creates a variety of different ways in which the millennial generation is not only leading a cultural shift, but also a very complex space and with that change doesn't always create opportunities for us to work most collectively together. It that when generations ask why, it exposes the opportunity for us to look at cultural change as a way in which problems will disrupt the system. When generations go a next step further and start to ask why not, which is ultimately what millennial leaders do, we start to see that social entrepreneurship becomes a thing culturally, and we get begin to solve problems by disrupting the system. When we start to look at what that really means for millennials, it means that we have to start defining who we are. It means that the term is more critical for us to start to look at. And the term applies to individuals who, if we go back, uh, applies to individuals who reach adulthood around the 21st century, around the turn of the 21st century, that is, born between 1980 and 1995. Researchers Powell and Strauss all um, kind of in that date around 1995. In my research, I like to end that date around 95. But a second round of that research will extend the date into the year 2000. So most generations have a 15-year uh, a lifespan, if you will, not necessarily lifespan, but a range, if you will, for ages. And so we're situated between the year 80 and 95. We're also, of course, known as Generation Y, directly following Generation Z. And today, the millennial generation makes up 1.7 billion individuals, a global population making a third of that population. Also, you'll see uh, that, as I said, our slide is going between a 15-year uh, uh, range, if you will, but um, some researchers are taking that five year, uh, uh, another five years to that and taking the generation into the year 2000. I do predict that maybe we'll see that 
slide coming back down to 95 as Generation Z and digital natives become more defined as it relates to their attributes. However, in the U.S., we're seeing, we, or we have seen that 80 million uh, of individuals in the U.S. are millennials. And we are truly the largest generation to date. And what that means for uh, organizations, organizational culture, and ultimately the, the space of diversity and inclusion, a result of the number, uh, the, the, the impact that will make 75% of the workforce will be millennials by 2025 and ultimately change the face of leadership. That's that organizational leaders are now becoming increasingly concerned that they may not be able to find the the traditional type of talent that they've seen over the years that they know is tried and true in allowing their organizations to succeed. However, it means that businesses are fiercely competing for the best talent avail available to not only replace boomers, but supplement the work that baby boomers have done over the years. And so it means that every year, more and more of that talent is going to be recruited from the ranks of millennials. There are some very serious reasons why millennials matter and how we're reframing and shaping the space of diversity and inclusion. The first reason was the organizational success and sustainability, of course, because we're a very large generation in number. Reason two, technology and, and the, the speed of just culture in general has sh shifted our patterns of consumption in a way where we learn quickly and we uh, seek to um, we seek advancement quickly. So that reason of being able to learn the ropes and then come for the, uh, our boss's job or look for the advancement quickly is critical. Reason three, we have options. We can work for a variety of different companies, but we can also decide we want to work for ourselves. And reason three, without us organizations, for the most part, as it, as it relates to success in, in only in number, but also externally and internally, organizations will start to wane. So three re reasons I'll give you that are directly connected to some of the things that you'll hear from our, our, our next couple of presenters are, one, millennials are leading the cultural shift, as I said. We're seeing, you know, we've seen a, a distinct increase of the largest generation today, an increase in not only diversity in number, but diversity in background, as we see a population shift as it relates to our ethnic makeup of our nation. Uh, we'll, we'll see that more millennials, for the most part, some, many are coming from, um, or many are coming from an, uh, single parent homes, blended families, um, have a uh, first born, a first generation born American. So we see that uh, from a diversity standpoint, as it relates to numbers, racially, ethnically, and our family makeup, we're leading a cultural shift. The third way that millennials are redefining the space of diversity and inclusion, is we have a very serious need for expression and acceptance. We less concerned about the the traditional way in which diversity is considered race, age, and gender, that is, a, that is an absolute for us. We must see, we, we are accustomed to and must see spaces where there are various races, uh, gender, ethnicity, ethnicity, et cetera. We're now more concerned about how the, those things then show up in the space of thoughts, ideas, and philosophy. <clears throat> Organizations are reforced to re are, are forced to rethink and redefine their approach. The reason, or the third way in which we are shifting um, diversity and inclusion or redefining, is that we're commanding inclusion and innovation. That means that these traditional spaces again have to rethink the way that they're um, that traditional spaces are having to rethink their approach because connectedness connectedness for us is very critical. We want to be able to see how diversity and inclusion impacts the bottom line of a business so that we can have greater innovation in that organizational space. So clearly we have the resources the voice and the power to be able to see how millennials are redefining the space of diversity and inclusion. And my research collectively um, through the six lessons of leadership in the, in the original millennial is that the thoughts around diversity and inclusion set the tone for who millennials will be as leaders in the, in the organizational culture that we ultimately will be a part of not only uh, where we're now, but, but as we see organizations shape what they are in the future. Thank you so much, Ariel. Um, everyone, my name is Sarah Vasquez, and I'm going to be continuing and sharing my experience with perception and the workplace.
ever asked a friend what their initial perceptions of you were? Did it surprise you? Time you walk into a room, people will have already made their own perception of you. So that's in a first impression. According to a report released by the Harvard Study of Communication, it only takes seven seconds for you to make a first impression on another human being. 30% of what makes up a first impression is how you sound. So they like in your voice, your pitch, loud or soft you speak. 55% of a first impression is based off of your physical appearance. Okay, so let's think on this one. How do you dress? What are you most strong to in choosing a shirt or blouse from your closet in the morning? Do you look to stand out among the other employees in your office space? percent of a first impression are the words you say. So that's strange how the very top percentages are based on physical traits that we can't quite control. So what insights can be found from these false impressions? Okay, so while first impressions may or may not be true, I think it's important for minorities and people in marginalized groups to understand what that perception is. And again, those perceptions may or may not be harmful, but can still be wrong. So take time to understand other people's perceptions of you can be difficult, but it can also provide really great insight into an environment you may be working in. It can provide insight into what your peers and coworkers may believe to be true of people from ethnic or diverse backgrounds. And this can be very helpful because once you start to understand how your peers may perceive you or someone with a background similar to you, the ball is then in your court to decide whether or not this perception is true and change it if you wish. So make a list of how people might perceive you and a separate list of how you perceive yourself. Links between these two separate lists. With links within these details, you can identify opportunities to showcase your strongest traits and find a way to use a stereotype or perception to your advantage. For example, I did from college a year earlier than I planned to. I'm about just under five feet, I have a soft speaking voice, and I will forever have a baby face. So what these descriptive traits say about me? Maybe nothing, maybe everything. If you didn't know much about me, and these were the only things that you could see or that you did know, what would you assume? Maybe she's young, uh, maybe she's smart, she's new, shy, um, she might even be naive. So I've done my, my homework and for a fact that this is usually how people might first perceive me when I walk into a room. When I relocated to Los Angeles after college, one of my goals was to create a new network for myself. I began reaching out to different professionals whose careers I wanted to learn more about. One met with a Hollywood producer. He didn't seem to take me very seriously at first and was very quick to make comments about my youthful appearance. But the thing is, I already knew that he was going to perceive me this way because he was expecting me to act a certain way. I surprised him by being my eloquent and mature self. So I may not look like I am in my mid-20s, but I still act like it. Again, this is an example of how you might be able to use false statements especially about millennials, the advantage. So we spent some time informing ourselves on the generalizations that people place on us and others, and we cross-reference these ideas of what we know to be true about ourselves. This is a very empowering thing and even draw inspiration into our desire to change the way that others view us and people might look, think, or act like us. These exercises can also be scary. They might cause fear or result in anxiety or overthinking. Time for another story. I mentioned in our previous slide, I understand how others perceive me. And sometimes they are based on like the traits, like the way I look or sound and things I can't quite change about myself. So a few years ago, I was an intern for the Barjan group. And there's a group of interns with me, and all of them were these overachieving, 
upperclassmen. Meanwhile, I had just began my sophomore year of college, and this one of my first PR-focused internships. So I couldn't help thinking about how much smarter, older, I know, more knowledgeable these other interns were than me. And one day, Nikki Barjon, the founder of the Barjon Group herself, called me out on this anxiety. She said, you're so worried about what other people may think of you that you allow them to think those things because you categorize yourself into them. And then I had not realized that I had been apologizing for my age out loud. I would say things like, oh, I know I'm the youngest here, or maybe this person should do this assignment since I haven't taken a class in this yet. It's literally absurd. I was taking myself out of the game before the coach even put me in. So that's my point. Spend time, spend more energy defining what people think than worrying about preconceived perceptions. Talk about pigeonholing. Okay. So in a Latina, I often face this inner battle with myself of owning diversity, owning my own diversity. And does that make any sense? Are there any other POCs who are listening to this and might feel the same way? So over the last few years, I have done several interviews, and I realized that usually the first question they ask me is if I speak Spanish, and I don't. I'm a Latina that doesn't know Spanish. Ring a bell. And I've had connections, have my resume to Latino specific or multicultural agencies or PR firms. And sometimes the it kind of bothers me because I realize that I can support minorities, I can support Latinos in my own way, being involved in the social interest groups that I'm a part of and the organizations that I lead. But it's taken me such a long time to realize that I am also allowed to have other passions, other career interests. So yes, a Latina millennial, it's my integral duty to represent my generation and people of color. But 2017, no person should be treated as a residential POC. So you can see above in the slide, I've selected students that represent current events and the newest portrayal of the minority or PC struggle. Public relations professionals spend hours sifting through trends in the news. They see the stories, they see the news, and it's their job to decipher what the public media are feeling so they can find a way to navigate and elevate their brands through these tensions. Sometimes they do mess up. I learned from Pat these big bots. Um, yeah, no, millennials don't go to protest for fun. But back to what I was saying, sometimes publication professionals can get so caught up in their branded work that they understand the real life effects and consequences of these current events. Like I said, you have to be the office to see. But know you have these but know that you can have these open types of conversations with supervisors and even coworkers of news and real life effects of POC of and real life effects of these news on POC and minimize groups. So go ahead, pick their brains and see what they really know about what's happening in their news. And yes, having these conversations can be difficult and will be difficult, but can greatly contribute to a company's efforts to be a more welcoming place. So one of my is under the recently ended Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or DACA program. And it's absolutely brilliant and is again as a WE for a top PR firm. And it wasn't until she decided to share her undocumented status with coworkers that they began to understand what DACA ending really meant. So fortunately, people aren't always bothered by things until they are one, affected personally, or two, know someone who is affected personally. And when her coworkers found out, they were so distraught at the possibility of losing one of their teammates, like one of their friends, that they flagged their supervisors, and their supervisors flagged managers. And pretty soon the GM knew what was going on himself. 
and they are working together to support and protect my friend in this time of instability. So, and you don't have to share personal information or um, go as far as maybe um, release a status, but by sharing your opinion on matters that affect you personally and that affect you emotionally, it can truly make a difference in the culture of your office environment. Thank you, Sarah, for all the great stories and information. So hello, everyone. This is Zhen Men uh, from University of Georgia. So today, I'd like to share some research findings based on a research project that we did last year. This project largely investigated millennial communication professionals' perceptions on recruitment, engagement, leadership development, and the retention efforts as demonstrated by their organizations. And the project was sponsored by the Planck Center for Leadership in PR and the Institute for Population. So to the research findings, let me share with you a very interesting finding from Deloitte study that helped us set the stage for our discussion on diversity and inclusion this afternoon. Generations. Millennials think about the diversity in a very different context. For example, millennials are more likely to define diversity as pertain to the individual mix of unique experiences, identities, ideas, and opinions. For diversity is not, not simply framed as those differences in demographics, equal opportunities, or the representation of identifiable or tangible demographic features such as age, gender, etc. For me, diversity means a variety of cultures and perspectives working together to solve business problems. And the seniors also define inclusion differently. Millennials, they focus primarily and extensively on teaming, team collaboration, value a culture of connectivity, both online and offline, and using collaborative tools and the technology to drive business impact. They have their understanding and expectation on inclusion if compared to prior generations. So, understanding and the high expectation on diversity and inclusion as expressed by millennials in general. Our research reached out to two different groups of respondents. The first included 420 millennial communication professionals, so we list it as MCP on the slide. And the second was 420 managers or MGRs listed on the slide who have supervised and worked with millennials in their organization. Some basic indicated <coughs> on this slide, the MCPs were about 63% female and 75% Caucasian. The majority in public and the private corporations, and their top job responsibilities included general communications, social media, digital communications, and the marketing communications. In the survey, males and females were represented about equally. They were diverse in terms of ethnic background and focused more on general communication, marketing, and employee communication. The hours have also had the opportunity to ask managers uh, the size of millennials they have managed before, and the size varied from small, like one to five, to large, more than 16. Those surveys, we asked them MCPs their perceptions on their workplace values and attributes, job engagement, leadership capabilities, leader development, organizations, recruitment and retention drivers, efforts, as well as their expectations on careerism outcomes. We asked the manager to assess millennials on the same areas question. So now some of our research findings. Surveys from both groups confirm that MCPs value diversity and inclusion in the workplace. The majority of our surveyed MCPs indicated that they value diversity of people, work-life balance, big supporters of the social causes and the socially responsible companies. They prefer working teams, and the managers also agree so. The rating items related to diversity and inclusion showed consistent patterns as well uh, between the two groups. MCs rated themselves high on valuing 
supportive people, seeking work-life balance, and being strong supporter of social causes and social responsibility companies. It is find out that managers actually rated MCPs higher on team collaboration than did millennials rated on themselves. We also found the gender matters. Female and male MCPs have very different perceptions. In our case, women rate most items higher than male MCPs. When about their own value on diversity related questions, women are more significantly positive than men. Female MCPs believe they value more diversity and they are more supportive of social causes and socially responsible companies. We also assessed the critical role of diversity in recruitment. We have 10 important recruitment drivers in helping MCPs make a job decision. Our drivers, there are three specifically relevant to organizations' recruitment efforts in increasing diversity and inclusion, as listed on this slide. Both MPs and managers believed it is very important for organizations to address their efforts in increasing diversity when recruiting top talent. All of that, actually, MVPs have been attracted to organizations by their efforts and initiatives in diversity and inclusion, either addressing job description sites or simply through the job interview process. MCP said that organizations who address the socially responsible programs offer a balanced work-life approach and supported and open and positive cultures are more appealing to them to choose to work for. Not the organization's retention efforts in diversity and inclusion are also important in retaining top talent. So after we recruited top talent, what we can do to keep them? Both VPs and the managers agreed that diversity programs and initiatives are important, as showed in the percentage on this slide. Both managers, uh, at the same time, we found managers believe that their organization are doing much more to retain MCP uh, than they are perceived in terms of efforts by the organization side. But both groups confirmed that organizations have been putting efforts in building the culture that values diversity and the inclusion. So the result of efforts have been made, but improvements are expected. MC that organizations have done a good job in supporting their work-life balance. They also felt they can do more in developing and engaging in socially responsible strategies and programs, more proactive in building up community engagement programs. They also felt organizations can do more in building up an open and a positive culture that values diversity and offer more training and development programs and workshops and opportunities. And also to be offer more mentoring opportunities for millennials to further develop job related skills and build up networks. So overall research showed MCPs they they are ambitious passionate about work and value diversity and social responsibility. They have they always care about the social cause that embedded within their job and organization. They want an organization who shares the same values with them. MC are confident about their future and they expect their organization to do so and also do more to establish diversity and inclusion as a priority on the corporate agenda. Sotberger will be presenting how millennials actually can take an active role in creating diversity and inclusion in their organization. Thank you. And good afternoon. My focus today is on how millennial communication professionals and publications teams can help lead and model diversity and inclusion change management in their companies, agencies, nonprofits, government educational organizations really across generations. Noted today, diversity in many forms is crucial in organizations. And the inclusion, in my mind, is the glue that binds individuals, teams, and organizations. Both Ariel and Joanne noted, research tells us that millennials value diversity 
diversity, inclusion, transparency, community. They it's important. They work in organizations that are in fact diverse and inclusive. So it's a generational belief and a value. But then the bigger issue is if we want to bring diversity and inclusion to life in our organizations, we have to see it as a significant cultural change that requires a change management approach. This is a process that organizations use to try to move from desiring a change condition to realizing and really living within that change condition. And I believe millennial communication professionals and public relations teams, in fact, can lead that change by being that change. And I'll describe how we can do that at individual and team levels. But first, a few words about change management the process. Here are four things. Things about change management. Uh, of course, change is a constant today. We know that. The mantra is change or die, literally. It's the key to survival and success. The real is are determining what are the right changes and being able to make them happen and to bring them to life. Second, 75% of the strategic change plans fail to realize all of their objectives, and often due to faulty leadership or poor communication or to cultural barriers and issues. The thing is, inertia is a powerful force. We've long time had this 20-60-20 rule, which says that 20% of employees in an organization seek and embrace change. 50% totally resist it. They don't want to change. And 6% are really in between and must be convinced of the need for change. And that's the target audience in change management. I think that the cycle time for change has a lot to do with the cost, which is an issue for management. Time change is first announced to the point it's enacted and effective, creates a productivity gap, a cost, if you will. And the effective communication can shrink the type cycle time for change. Natural change of all kinds is grounded on really three foundation stones. First, have to support the change for any significant change, including diversity and inclusion. If there's no support at the top, things probably aren't going to change. So communications are crucial. And by that, I mean multiple channels, two-way, face-to-face, repetitive, interactive sessions that can help inspire, explain, compel, and drive change awareness, understanding, belief, and ultimately action. The third, maybe the biggest of all, is organizational culture, which can enable change, slow it, or block it entirely. This is where PR professionals come into play. As our say, Beth Plank said more than 30 years ago, the best communicators are agents of change, responsible change for our organizations to help drive and lead that change, uh, like embedding diversity and inclusive, inclusive deeply in our culture. It's not enough to say we support the change. It's not enough to say organizations organizations need more diversity inclusion. It's not to say that it's one of our values. Those things aren't enough. We serve as agents of change to bring diversity and inclusion to life. We literally be the change. So how can we do that? How can millennial communication professionals drive diversity and inclusion change? Well, at the individual level, a couple of things. First, pair and tell a compelling to the inclusion story. Advocate, explain why. Why in the world is it so crucial in our organization? Can you do so? And most importantly, can you link it to the real questions and concerns that employees may have across generations? Then, the rich narrative include vision for DNI, the benefits, some case events, success stories, and so on. Second, tell your compelling story compellingly. In my seven years of teaching multi-millennial um, communication professionals at the University of Alabama, I have learned firsthand how tech-savvy millennials are and about their strong values. I've also seen some concerns, notably, about interpersonal communication skills and critical thinking. If you'd rather text than talk in the workplace, that can be a problem in selling change across the generation. Speaking. Story. Pop Voice, your listening, speaking, storytelling skills, and think of three, three formats really that classic sort of 60 second elevator speech where you set your story and then longer five or 
10 minute stories that you can tell in more formal uh, or informal settings. Now, what about relations teams? The team and functional level, I think most important for us to model the way. How we advocate effectively for change if your team or if our team doesn't reflect that desire to change. Your public relations team should do so in terms of how it treats, how it empowers, recruits, includes, and really develops people. In addition, the team must steadily push back on organizational culture and structure that really slow, impede, or block the needed change. Culture back is a huge issue because it's constantly churning. So the challenge is to continue to push for and create a culture for communication, which I believe is the true framework and enabler for the inclusion and, frankly, all big change programs. Dr. Grunig, the foremost uh, researcher in public relations, developed the concept of a culture for communication about 30 years ago. And the qualities of a culture like this are indicated in this slide. This type of communication-centered culture really provides a a richer environment for enhancing our collective cultural competencies, really for learning, sharing information, best practices, being participative and inclusive, equaling, empowering, listening to each other, and reinforcing our commitment to each other in the organization. All of competencies create a stronger sense of team and organizational identity, creativity, greater engagement, and stronger financial performance. Best of all, for all of us, they can yield a great place to work. Now, culture is difficult. Sustaining it is equally challenging because of the larger environment shifts, some of which Ariel certainly described, and those that take place in organizations. Food, relating what I believe are the key change drivers uh, that millennial communication professionals and PR teams can and really must use. First, let's look at diversity and inclusion not as a novelty, not as a difference, but as a cultural, a crucial culture of change that we must help manage and lead. Believe it, we can be the change if we possess the willpower and tenacity required. Willpower is absolutely crucial. We model the way as a team. We need to tell compelling stories compellingly again and again and again. And always, we need to push back on culture and structure in order to create a culture for communication. Thank you. I'll turn it back to Leah at this point. Thank you uh, to the rest of our panelists. Now, for our audience members, this is your opportunity to ask our panelists um, some of the questions that you might have from the material that they discuss. So, on you all's um, computers, you have um, a K box that should be right next to the chat box. Box, but it's a key box and it'll allow you guys to type in your questions and I'll get those to our panelists. So I will get us kicked off with the Q&A uh, with the first question and then hopefully we'll have some questions rolling in from you all in our audience. The first question for the panelists, uh, what are some things that you do personally to promote DI in the workplace? And you guys just can answer in whatever order and however you choose. Ariel with an answer to that question. I think for me as a, a professor and a consultant, it's a, a, a space that I'm in regularly and helping organizations uh, issue diversity and inclusion uh, and then also teaching my students in uh, the communication, strategic communication and PR major as well as journalism major um, what it means to really embrace and embody the spirit of diversity and inclusion and make it come to life in in, in the work that they do. Um, I think that what we have to do, though, is start to see real action. So it's one thing to keep a conversation going. I think the Planck Center does an excellent job at that. I think I know the PRSA, our National Diversity Committee, does an excellent job at that, too. But we have to start to see programs, initiatives, that really move diversity and inclusion forward. And then also beyond creating the programs and initiatives, we have to also do some measurement, assessment, and reflection to ensure that the work that we're doing is actually getting us to a more uh, inclusive and equitable environment. Uh, in. This is Sarah speaking. Um, so just like how she said about 
um, taking like go from talking points to actually creating creating like um, like action points. Um, I mentioned in my panel, I feel like it's so important to actually have these conversations in the workplace. So the things that you read, um, young people, especially millennials, a lot of the times we get our news from things that we see on um, Twitter and Facebook. If you if you read an article in the morning about something that um, bothers you or something that like pertains to you, pertains to people who are like you, it, share it with your coworkers, ask them what they think about it. Um, like I said before, as PR professionals, we spend so much time sifting through information that sometimes we become blind to what the news really means for, for our friends and for our community. So I think it's important to ask people about how they feel about certain things, just so that they know that, yes, um, like the current events are happening and, you know, they are affecting people in my work environment who look like me or feel the same way I do. Hi, this is Joanne speaking. So from a higher education educator's perspective, we try to encourage students in class to have different assignments that involve discussion on diversity and inclusion. Since most of my students are now the, almost the end of the millennial generation and we started getting Gen Z coming to college and which is the uh, bright generation that we need to think about how to uh, encourage them to embrace in the diversity and inclusion. Uh, teaching perspective, we also involve different guest speaking uh, guest speakers invited from, you know, organizations and uh, entrepreneur, uh, those starting up business owners to share their diverse background in terms of facing different challenges to share their experience with students to actually encourage students uh, and give them early exposure about the diversity and inclusion efforts the industry or organization have been making. Cool. Anyone else that wanted to weigh in on that one? Our uh, second question uh, goes directly to Dr. Meng. Uh, this person says, Dr. Meng, thank you for sharing your research. First, I was wondering if you or the Planck Center could share out a link where your work was published. Do you have a response to that one? Uh, thanks for the question, and absolutely. And for this uh, millennial uh, communication professional project, we have finished, and we have already uh, released and published uh, research results in a research report on Planck Center's website. If you go to Planck Center's website and under the tab of research, you will be able to download uh, the research report, which uh, will give you uh, summarize the findings and some key takeaways that you can you, you know use to share with either your colleagues or just as a reading uh, to help you to understand what we research. Wonderful. The this, this section we have, uh, Professor Berger's emphasis on compelling storytelling is a key point. How would the panel relate this to the enormous groundswell on social media this week behind the hashtag MeToo call to action? Can we create a similar concise call to action around D&I? Um, I mean, Bruce, um, that is an absolutely terrific question. Um, and I have to talk with anybody who's interested in talking about that. I hardly know what to even say at the moment, but I get to um, a really good question, and I think people at the Planck Center would certainly be interested in uh, in that. So who has a question, uh, if you're willing to contact us or interested that much in it, please do so, because I'd love to try to chase it somewhere. Are there anything that they wanted to win on that question? Ariel, I'd like to weigh in just slightly on that. I agree with Dr. Berger. I think that there is power. Of course, we know as communicators, there's power in being able to share and tell a story. I think, though, there would be concerns um, of sharing their stories, particularly if they're negative about some experiences that they've had around, you know, lack of diversity and inclusion and even equity 
And I think there is an excellent opportunity for us to potentially you know, create a movement around it or someone to create a movement around that in connection to the way in which the hashtag Me Too, Me Too movement has just kind of taken over in the past couple days. But I, I would be concerned or about the power of that, that based on the fact that many individuals would be concerned about any backlash from you know, certain companies or their careers or, you know, mentioning or, or disclosing information about if they were wronged in the workplace or if they were wronged in the workplace, if we were to parallel them in that way. But there is power in that. And I think that if, if there was an opportunity or if someone did, you know, create an opportunity for that, I think that then our industry, um, because we lead, you know, conversations around when ads are you know, offensive or when language, you know, um, excludes or, or portrays certain demographics in a, in a negative light, there's opportunity for us to, to, to um, you know, capitalize on that to, the, to, to have a conversation. But I would be, I think people would not participate because of the concern about what would that look like for them, um, the relationship it's to be sharing information connected to the career. Um, but there's absolutely a way, I believe, for us to, to do that. And just to follow on here, Ariel and Joanna, is something uh, that would be um, good to do, interesting to do, uh, starting even in the classroom with students through mm -hmm. some kind of project or whatever. There are, as you point out, there are a number of issues and related concerns, but, but um, it's something that uh, uh, offers, I think, some terrific opportunities. That's great. And we still have a few uh, questions coming in. We still have a few minutes left, so if you guys have any additional questions that you would like to ask our panelists, um, feel free to still submit them in the Q&A box. Our next question that we received, what are your recommendations for getting more diverse candidates in the pipeline for recruitment? And that can go to anyone. Okay, Vicky, I'd like to uh, kick off uh, the discussion of this question. That is a great question, and I think that's the challenge uh, we are facing both in the industry and also in the uh, higher education. How can we fill up the pipeline to increase the diversity, uh, no matter from the student body and also for the young uh, professionals? We need to look into diversity from more of their perspective not just the uh, classic or old-fashioned way in terms of defining diversity uh, about those tangible characteristics that we, uh, or I discussed uh, earlier and our panelists discussed earlier. We're looking to uh, multiple criteria or multiple uh, different sets, uh, different sets of the skills the candidate can bring in and use their interpretation and their understanding of diversity and inclusion to really maximize uh, the use of the different sets of the skill. Uh, that way, uh, not, I would say not just uh, filling up the pipeline, but also uh, really bring their best out of their uh, mind and out of their, you know, prepared knowledge and a career path. I'm going to weigh in too, as um, from my perspective as a recent college graduate. Um, I agree with what you said. We should be looking at it from the students' perspectives. Um, I think that, that recruiters should meet the students where they are. Um, when I was in college, there were so many um, like DNI interest groups that I feel like recruiters would have communicated with or could have printed with at their means. Uh, and there's so many talented students that would have loved to like have the chance to sit down with a recruiter and talk about um, a company or potential job. So I think if recruiters um, would spend more time um, actually looking for these types of organizations and colleges, um, it would probably make their search a lot easier. I'll weigh in on that one. If not, we have another question. Okay, next question. Oh, was that someone? Next 
question, how do millennials combat old structures and old ways of doing business? Anyone? I love this. Hello. Please, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I definitely feel like I should answer this question. Um, that's difficult. I Ariel mentioned a little bit about this in her panel, but I feel like we're we're already doing it. Um, it's a uh, transitions already taking place. Um, I think some organizations are a little bit, I guess, resistant to change, um, but from experience, um, working, and I guess in my first like full time job, um, I haven't faced that much opposition. I guess to little ideas or little opportunities in the workplace. I feel like in my area, from company to company, but um, the area that I'm at at Edelman um, is very interested in hearing what I have to say, and I think it's because um, a lot of the brands they work with who are they targeting right now they're targeting millennials and i'm a millennial um whenever i have an opportunity to speak about an idea i have in regards to a communication strategy or the way i feel about a certain advertisement um people are usually very eager to like listen to me and to kind of take my in on these subjects um i do think that if you are in a company that maybe maybe is is structured differently, like maybe they do not allow like younger people to speak out to have a say in um, a strategy as other companies might do. Um, maybe there's an opportunity opportunity for you to talk to um, a manager, um, a supervisor, a GM, and collaborate on your ideas with this person. Maybe together you and this person might be able to bring those large ideas to meeting to another, um, I guess, a meeting with like a large group of people and just like share those ideas, just that you have a little bit more of support and it's not as scary speaking out or, you know, speaking on your own. Let me just comment on that quickly. I think that's a, that's a terrific idea, Sarah. Um, every, every generation confronts this question that was raised. What do I have to change how things have been done or are being done by a different generation? Um, I went to that personally uh, before coming to academia. I spent 20 years in corporate public relations practice, uh, working with uh, and across generations. And I think the if we look look at the millennial data that uh, Jan shared, other parts of that data set, what we see is that while the differences in in perspectives and percentages, there's actually at the core a fairly strong group of majors from other generations who are really quite supportive of millennial communication mm -hmm. professionals. And so in addition to turning to a manager, as Sarah suggested, look for people in your organization who you deal to, do feel that there's some sort of positive relationship with or positive opportunity who you know opens up to you a little bit in terms of wanting to get you involved in doing things. What I'm suggesting is also some real strong allies in virtually any organization that you will work in. Look for those, those allies. One bridge for that. Uh, we are now going to wrap up with our last question. Uh, so feel free to make your comments on this list. If you could give our audience members with one key message about millennials and diversity in the PR industry, what would it be? I'll, this is this Ariel. I'll say that um, to millennial, uh, we're leading a cultural shift, and we we have to to be the ones who continue to ensure that diversity and inclusion and equity continues to be at the forefront of the organizations that we serve. And so we must be champions in that space. This is June. So I would just say be proactive and uh, uh, bring uh, the millennials within the organization and with a mentor to really challenge them and give them different opportunities to take the leadership role. So prepare them 
uh, well as the future leaders of our profession. Might be to um, be like Gandhi. Okay, be polite, be personal, be persistent. Advice would be good work, hard work, work, continue that work. The change is happening now, and it will stop changing. Well, thank you all for choosing to spend your afternoon with the Plank Center and asking some awesome questions about millennials, diversity, and inclusion in the PR industry. I would like to say a special thank you to our panelists who provided a meaningful conversation on this topic. And please note that the webinar will be archived on the Plank Center's website, so feel free to come back to it later and also share with your colleagues and friends. So thank you all again so much for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you.